most distastefully overall, Patrice sat down with Alicia Garza and Melina Abdullah to discuss their reflections on the George Floyd protests while sipping champagne and delighting over an assortment of, of what we call it, meats, cheeses, and fruits. Charcuterie, charcuterie, however you like to say it. and welcome back for another video be sure to respectfully comment along I'm sure tons of people have thoughts on this very topic and I just wanted to shed a little bit more perspective a little bit more light while much can be said about the fallout that we saw this year with Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund under the leadership of Patrice Cullors the six million dollar mansion, the house parties hosted at said mansion, the soft life video shot at the mansion, the clinking of champagne while discussing black death. You know, I definitely wanted to provide a lane that slices through the alt-right fascist outlook of Candace Owens and that MAGA crew that has really devoured and delighted in BLM's demise as a means for their own grifts to profit. But rather, I wanted to discuss what we really lost in this BLM debacle from a black liberatory lens. That there was no public accountability upheld by Patrice Cullors community was a deeply significant law. We had the opportunity to see a true model of accountability. And instead, these same thinkers, intellectuals, and activists, close friends of Patrice, bowed their heads, lowered their eyes, and sat on their hands, refusing to enact any of the frames of accountability that even some of them claimed as their own original theory. We're gonna get into this, we're gonna break it down, and let's really have a talk about what accountability actually is. Because I promise you, it is not punishment. <laughs> Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund is part of the Black Lives Matter ecosystem that is made up of three organizations. You have the Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which is a network of local chapters, that's the activist arm. Black Lives Matter PAC, which endorses candidates and policy, that's the political arm. And then the Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund, which is the nonprofit. Most of the criticisms that have truly stuck and really brought us into the debacle of this year are centered around the nonprofit organization and their handling of over $90 million in donations. They came through in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and the protests of summer 2020. Now, hashtag Black Lives Matter was coined by Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tamati, who I believe has changed their name to AO. But the center of this discussion really is more so around Alicia and Patrice. Patrice, who was head of the nonprofit arm, and Alicia, who up until this critique and criticisms really tipped over, had been using her alignment and notoriety as a founder of BLM in her bio across all her media displays, and it was really how she was branding herself. She was also very front stage in pushing back against these critiques and having a hand in why there was this lack of accountability when it became very clear that there were significant mistakes made while Patrice was at the helm of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund. But to get back to the history of it all, hashtag Black Lives Matter was coined by Patrice, Alicia, and Opal after George Zimmerman received a not guilty verdict in what we all knew was the murdering and his hand in murdering the teenager Trayvon Martin. Now with the advent of the spectacle of black death that to continue to happen, particularly with the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in August 2014, 
hashtag Black Lives Matter was able to rise to prominence as the rock star organization leading the protest. Late summer of 2014 and the rise of Black Lives Matter as an organization heralded by Patrice, Alicia and Opal also saw the rise of several social media activists and the makings of 21st century movement rock stars, where a new age of celebrity presented itself in the social justice civil rights movement. With these movement rock stars, we see the re-manifestation of social hierarchies and black exceptionalism that promotes an individualism that guarantees that someone, or at least a small group of someones, is always proper up as the ones and instead of treating things like black death at the hands of the state as a condition we are left treating it as an event where this small group of rock stars profits and rises to prominence in these spaces of multiple public deaths that see black bodies gunned down by police with no actual change in the systems we live under or the conditions that we are exposed to just individuals who gain significant profit. Now we do have to give a brief interlude because this video is sponsored by Audible. And if you have never used the Audible app, now is your time to use my code. You can text Julesy to 500-500 or use my link audible.com slash Julesy and get your first month free on Audible. Audible is a app full of audiobooks, original series, podcast, as I love to say, auditory treats. And if you're new here, you probably don't know that I run the SBG Book Club. We are focused on making black political and black feminist literature more accessible to a broader audience. And we do a ton of reading, therefore I do a ton of reading. I'm also in grad school as a history major. And baby, I keep saying this time and time again, the only way I'm surviving this at this point is because of Audible and having access to such a great library, both academic, fiction, nonfiction, original series, on Audible. I'm a paying member and I absolutely love my experience. And this month in my book club, we are reading Gloria Naylor's Mama Day. And I absolutely love the audiobook version of this. It is just such a great listen and I'm truly enjoying it. So if you're looking for something to read, come on over to the SBG side, use my Audible link, audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500-500 and get your first month free and then come pick up any of our recommendations at the SBG Book Club and join along for some very great reads. Everyone is welcome. So shout out to Audible because you know one of the only reasons I'm still here, we still knocking, we still kicking, <laughs> is because of them. <laughs> Now, particular to Black Lives Matter, the critiques began to come in before the establishment of the nonprofit arm. After a flush of donations in 2015 from the likes of Prince and Beyonce that passed directly through the founders, activists from local chapters began to voice their concerns about the organization's lack of transparency, their operations and donation handling that was not equally distributed to their network of local chapters. However, the effect of movement rock stars rising to prominence means that many of us never even heard of the early 2015, 2016 critique. Unless you were embedded into this space, you likely don't know that there was a convening or a convention of sorts for BLM activists after they raised these concerns and many left out of that meeting upset and feeling like they were not heard at all and were just offered platitudes and political statements that really didn't address how this money was flowing through the organization and who was profiting it from it and who was left unsupported and to toil while trying to push for progress on the ground in their local city. In essence, it becomes very hard for criticism to be accepted and acted upon when someone has gained significant celebrity within a movement. Because essentially those people who are seen as the prominent ones, the celebrity, the rock star, we, people, will weaponize sort of that identity against anybody who attempts to criticize them, no, more to, no matter how valid that critique is. 
it soon becomes, and we, we see this in the response that many of Patrice's peers offer that I'm really gonna dig into later. Even this idea that, oh, she's a black woman and black women are always attacked. Okay, but we're talking about black women and black queer folks who are feeling harmed by her. We're not talking about the white MAGA alt-right people who are jumping into this. We're talking about the, there are actual very valid critiques that you are not answering to. And we could even take this out of BLM. You think about if any, there's, we all kind of participate in this upliftment of movement rock stars where someone we've idolized someone because of the work that we've seen them do and then they become untouchable like you know we, we could extrapolate this out to the angela davises of the world a ruth wilson gilmore um these other people and even if they don't enact that celebrity or engage in that celebrity themselves there are often other players who are in the upper echelons or upper rungs of society that come in to shield them from any critique, even when it's coming from intra-community. When we look at that with regards to the fallout of BLM, that these critiques and criticisms don't even have the opportunity to be heard. It's particularly sad within a movement that claims to be about radical liberation. Though we began to see some nascent call outs from individuals about the harms caused by the Black Lives Matter eco ecosystem of organizations to activists on the ground who are unsupported and uncared for, the celebrity of the founders have them insulated in the privilege and the upper echelons of black society and allows them to skirt most of the criticism. And then the true heat of criticism that bubbles over into the public sphere does not occur until 2022 when mainstream media picks up on the story. We can concede that within the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 and Donald Trump holding the office of president, alt-right MAGA people took an unprecedented interest in demonizing the movement. Racism is motivation for most of the 8.5 by 11 people who seek to critique and desecrate BLM, but still critiques from the community, the community that they themselves, they the founders invited in, have been bubbling over since 2015. And the handling of the nonprofit left plenty of fodder to be uncovered. Essentially, the handlers of BLM brought much of the heat on to themselves. <laughs> In 2020, 10 chapters of the Black Lives Matter Grassroot Network issued a public call for greater financial accountability. In their statement, it read, for years, there has been inquiry regarding the financial operations of Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund and no acceptable process of either public or internal transparency about the unknown millions of dollars donated to BLM Global Network Fund, which has certainly increased during this time of pandemic and rebellion. The organization responded to this criticism three months later by releasing for the first time in seven years, detailed information about its finances, revealing that they had raised more than $90 million in 2020, that they had incurred $8.4 million in operating expenses, distributed $21.7 million in grants to more than 30 organizations, and retained some $60 million in their account. Now I will say in that report, it was a little vague about who those organizations were or how it was decided that these organizations received money and how much each organization received, but that was the first time that any detailed finance report had been released. And after this first glimpse into the finances of Black Lives Matter, families of victims whose name, image, and legacy had been invoked by BLM and other social activists as they curated their own profitable brands, these surviving family members issued their own complaints about lack of support. Michael Brown Sr., the father of the Michael Brown Jr. who was murdered in Ferguson that really hit off the high point of BLM's rise, along with another Ferguson activist, uh, posted a video demanding $20 million for local programs and organizers. Two mothers of victims of police violence, Lisa Simpson and Samiria Rice, released a statement calling for Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund and others to stop capitalizing on their suffering. 
In part, it stated, we don't want or need y'all parading in the streets, accumulating donations, platforms, movie deals, off the death of our loved ones, while the families and communities are left clueless and broken. Don't say our loved ones' names, period. That's our truth. Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund offered no official response. Though leaders at some prominent chapters released what could be implied as shady responses to critiques coming from these families. <laughs> to get to the mansion, in October 2020, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund received a $66.5 million from its fiscal sponsor. Now, a fiscal sponsor is typically a larger nonprofit with federally recognized tax exemption status, typically as a 501c3 nonprofit. And they sort of sponsor you in that they donate their tax exempt nonprofit status to smaller organizations or organizations that don't have the sort of operations infrastructure because having a nonprofit as my book club is a 501c3 requires a good amount of paperwork and filing on a yearly basis and all these regulations in order to keep your good status. Typically these larger organizations that donate their or sponsor smaller nonprofits and essentially donate their nonprofit status uh, charge a small fee that includes coverage for the administrative care that they provide. So for BLM, that originally was an organization called Thousand Currents that took 15% of all funds, which is kind of high for the standard rate, which is somewhere between five and 10%. Like we had a fiscal sponsor and they took 9%. But most recently, the Global Network Fund transitioned to Tides Foundation, which also takes a 9% fee. Now, after this $66.5 million is received from their fiscal sponsor, Two weeks later, a man named Diane Pascal, the financial manager of Patrice Colors and her then spouse, Jenea Khan's LLC, Jenea and Patrice Consulting, this uh, financial manager of theirs purchased a seven bedroom, $6 million house for Black Lives Matter that would become known as the campus. Now I have to state that it is entirely not unusual for nonprofits that receive large amounts of donations to be investigated. Major publications and investigative journalism outlets like ProPublica have done deep dives into various organizations who are very visible in collecting large donations and BLM at the point where they're receiving historical numbers of donations should have expected that there would be some public review, especially because you're a public nonprofit and you have to publish a 990, but that there would be some public review of their organization. And so a young black writer began to follow the trail for Black Lives Matter's rather discreet nonprofit arm that wasn't really providing a lot of transparency around how money was coming in and going out and was for the most part covering up a lot of their purchases. And what ended up being published in New York Magazine, this young black male writer, Sean Kevin Campbell, investigated how the organization was spending their money. And after Sean submitted an inquiry about the house in March, 2021, an internal strategy memo was circulated by Black Lives Matter leaders on possible responses to Sean's inquiry, including, can we kill the story to our angle needs to be to deflate ownership of the property. An internal memo that circulated included bullet points explaining that campus is part of a cultural arm of the org, potentially as an influencer house where abolition plus base content is produced by artists and creatives. Another bullet point is headed accounting 990 modifications and reads in part, needs to first make sure it's legally okay to use as we plan to use it. The memo also describes the property as a safe house for leaders whose safety had been threatened. Within this memo, we have two notions contradicting themselves, that the house is simultaneously a confidential refuge for the highly visible leaders when their safety is compromised, but then also a place for broadcasting to the widest possible audience. That, that, that definitely is some tension there. 
And when Patrice launched her YouTube channel, she was largely shooting content inside the very wealthy aesthetics of this mansion. Because the memo also notes, holes in security story, use in public YouTube video. Now, aside from the house, <laughs> because there is more. BLM Global Network Fund had put, had paid the father of Patrice's child $86,000 in 2019, $150,000 in 2020, and a whopping $970,000 in 2021. Colors and the consulting agency she owned with her spouse, Janaea Khan, received $205,000 in 2019, amongst other six-figure payouts to people who were close to Patrice and employed at BLM Global Network Fund. Now, additionally, when the 990 came out in May 2020 of this year, it showed alongside that $970,000 to her child's father, Patrice's brother Paul also received $840,000. Now, Patrice's spouse, Janaea, was the co-founder founder of Black Lives Matter Toronto chapter and they purchased an $8.1 million home with money guaranteed from the BLM Global Network Fund. Now subsequently some members of that chapter were pushed out after they questioned the house purchase. Colors herself reimbursed the organization a mere $390 for the use of the $6 million mansion from which she had spent several nights, launched her personal YouTube channel that has since been scrubbed, and she was also featured in the YouTube Black Voices, and they are down with us. It was a little awkward. And she also hosted parties at the mansion. Most distastefully overall, Patrice sat down with Alicia Garza and Melina Abdullah to discuss their reflections on the George Floyd protests while sipping champagne and delighting over an assortment of, of what we call it, meats, cheeses, and fruits. Charcuterie, charcuterie, however you like to say it. Now, the families of the black lives they claim to represent and the chapters that were organizing on the ground, they received next to nothing. For the rest of the egregious details, I'll link down below to the New York Magazine articles that Sean Kevin Campbell wrote. I think they're very insightful. They are a great approach to all the details without being racist or, you know, particularly demeaning. And they also speak to a bunch of uh, experts in the field of nonprofit analysis. <laughs> lapse in accountability is how Patrice Colors, who was the only founder still directly involved with the organization, but also Alicia Garza, who had moved on since 2017, but took an outside role in pushing back and criticizing Sean Kevin Campbell's story. They both took upon a media tour attempting to distill the impact of Sean's investigation. And I think it's most interesting that in her choices for which media outlet she was going to speak to, Patrice Cullors chose Jason Lee and The Hollywood Reporter, in which they went back and forth about how she deserved to pay herself, how you have to be paid for the work. Now, Patrice, full, full on, full out, took on the poor me route, claiming that she didn't know what 990s were and that the term 990 is triggering. She said that the nonprofit structure was being weaponized against her. It was obviously the obvious lean in is to weaponize your identity and say, hey, I'm a black woman, how dare you criticize me or claim I was a harm doer. Now, Alicia, though we repeatedly have to say that she was not directly involved with the organization, took a much more verbose stance going on an interview with Van Lathan, a friend, and stating that she didn't read Sean Kevin Campbell's article. She only skimmed it, but she knew for sure that there were no receipts in it. It lacked any integrity. She saw nothing wrong with her champagne video at the mansion. It didn't matter if they had did that video in front of a McDonald's. And she outright dismisses Sean's journalism as nothing more than a high school level journalism because he included her name when she hasn't been associated with the organization in 2017, even though she was in that video with a good friend 
who was directly affiliated and co-founder of BLM and they was clicking champagne and claiming that they won and claiming all the work they've done and really just claiming ownership over the success of the response to the George Floyd protest. I'm feeling good and I'm feeling like we're winning. Yeah. We're winning. The hardest moments have been the right-wing media machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. leveraging literally all its weight yeah. against me, against our movement, mm -hmm. against BLM, the organization. Mm -hmm. So many people who I've talked to, and, and I've obviously talked to the two of you at nauseum about mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. but it's because we're powerful, because mm -hmm. we are winning. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden, when there is legitimate critique, both about the handling of the monies and that distasteful champagne video. <laughs> Don't say my name. Don't say my name. Now Van Lathan went on to interview Sean Kevin Campbell in an interview where Van leaned into being very defensive of his friend Alicia. And he took a very aggressive tone with Sean then the reason why they're doing something wrong should be something I should be allowed to ask you. Yeah, and you can ask. And I can say, I said you asked what issues there were, and these were the issues. It's not my place to judge the organization, to say, you know, I'm how they're doing their things. Honestly, even donors wait, 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 wait. You, you don't just, have a you, You've judged the organization. In, Hold on, one second, though. One second, though. You've judged the organization the whole time. You, they, you said that they were unstrategic. Like, I asked you, you've judged the organ. Like, look, Sean, I'm not in Black Lives Matter at GNF. I don't know anybody in Black Lives Matter at GNF. Well, since you've been on here, you've been talking about your problems with Black Lives Matter at GNF. I'm asking you a direct question about why, where you think the source of that problem is com coming from, and you're deflecting. As a matter of fact, I think in this whole fallout, Van Lathan definitely owes an apology to Sean because it was quite uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> most unfortunate part of the situation is that in accruing the celebrity as leaders of this movement, Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors convened an insular community of other movement rock stars from the social justice and prison abolition space and that themselves, these other rock stars also claim to be rooted in the emergent strategies of theorizing about the frameworks of resistance that would be indebted to community in a mutual understanding of love, care, and accountability outside of the bounds of a carceral state. That, that's, that's, that's not a word salad. I promise you that is actual abolitionist theoretical approach to things and these are how these like sort of the people that they are in community with the sort of work that they produce in particular we have the adrian marie brown a friend of patrice's who published the book we will not cancel us and other dreams of transformative justice in 2020 that directly pushes back against call out culture while insisting on the utility of community call-ins the book opens with the statement Abolitionists know that the implications of our visions touch everything. Everything must change, including us. We must build life-affirming institutions, including our movements. Brown goes on to declare that I don't want to protect those who cause harm or limit the options of survivors. I want healing for all. I want to bring attention to patterns that echo and generate harm for survivors and harm doers. Brown further asserts that they have a vision that movements or social and environmental justice become living models of abolition with the rigor to fight fair, struggle in principled ways, and practice accountability beyond punishment with each other. Again, she expresses that she definitively knows that movements are often tense with the contradiction between what we believe and are fighting for and what we feel we must practice to navigate current conditions. And that mistakes can be resolved with authentic informed apologies. This book literally begins like a very nascent framework of what community-minded accountability actually looks like. And Adrienne Marie Brown maps out a bunch of questions that include is are the survivors being adequately supported? I think that would have been an awesome question to consider within the realm of the call outs against Black Lives Matter Global Network Fund. I am 
absolutely understand pushing back against the nefarious players who jumped with joy at the opportunity to disparage Black Lives Matter. But I am still befuddled, maybe even a little bemused, that Adrian, like many of Patrice's peers, evaded their own work, their own frameworks that they had mapped out for accountability and transformative justice, and instead relied on only responding to bad faith actors. In a speech delivered at Tulane University's Leadership Speaker Series in 2021, Adrienne centered her talk around Patrice, declaring her love and support for her good friend amidst criticism. While she stated that movements can be a balm to systemic wounds, but it doesn't make those of us in movement immune to the patterns of pain and harm with which those systems function. In fact, all of us move through the world perpetuating these systems in a variety of ways. And if we forget this, we can lose touch with a crucial aspect of the work, our self-transformation and our responsibility, not just for what we say, but for how we are. And you would think that means that Adrian is leaning into the complex understanding, dealing with the harder feelings around someone who you are in community with, who having made a mistake and struggling through that. But she goes on to only list systems of harm that have intruded against Patrice's well-being. There's no mention of the activists left to toil or the mothers, fathers, and siblings of stolen lives who are left to struggle while their child's name and legacy was used for personal gain. I am perplexed. These are people who are fully aware that you can be a good person and do a bad thing, that you can make a mistake, and that per Adrian, you can be, this can be remedied with an informed and authentic apology. They also are people that should indeed understand the necessity of struggle, a term that we might often assume to mean financial struggle, poverty, like deprivation, but rather struggle is actually just a discomfort, holding tension and moving through shame and not dishonoring the critique. It means that when someone has a valid call out to you as a harm doer, that you aren't running away and disavowing or dismissing whatever the harmed has to say, but that you, if you are a person who declares yourself to be a for a black liberation, if you claim to be doing this work and you deserve to be paid for doing this work of community building, you then will not shroud away from the more difficult aspects of this work and you will engage in the struggle, this synthesis, this processing, like how do we even theorize? Theorize doesn't come with ease. That also in self includes some struggle when we converge and think about how our ideologies might contradict and how we have to move through that. The idea to even approach this topic largely came because we read Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Pleasure Activism, in my book club. And I then, when uh, we will, in my book club, when we had an abbreviated author chat with them, and then when We Will Not Cancel Us came out, I picked up the book, I read it, and I will, to full disclosure, when I first read it, I thought it made a lot of sense. And Brie Reed, who is in the syllabi cohort for the book club where we produce reading guides and a lot of work around making these readings more accessible, Brie was the one who had introduced me to Adrienne Marie Brown and had even suggested pleasure activism. So I hit her up about reviewing We Will Not Cancel Us. And it is probably one of my favorite Patreon posts to date. We did a podcast where we discussed We Will Not Cancel Us and Brie just offered such compassionate and careful and salient critiques and pushbacks against the way Adrian approached transformative justice and this call for don't do call outs even though I understand call outs are necessary because of the power dynamic and when you're being dismissed or not heard when you try to do the call in within community then you need to go to the call out but don't do it and you know Brie really kind of synthesized it in a way that was very meaningful and really helped me even with my own journey as a semi-public figure who also can receive critiques. And that is one of the harder parts of being on the internet is to understand when are critiques done in good faith? When are these things that you can actually take and learn from? And when are they done in bad faith? Because people will talk to you all kinds of wild on the internet. 
they will. But that doesn't mean that you have that you are allowed to dismiss everything that's ever said to you. And I really love the point that Brie made when she brought up the work of June Jordan and this idea of getting in the living room and struggle. Like if you are going to invite people into community, if you are going to claim to represent them when it is profitable, you then also again have to deal with the more complex, harder components of fostering a community of compassion. You don't get to run away from it when it's no longer just comes with a big paycheck. Especially when you have exploited the, the legacy of people that aren't here to consent to that sort of exploitation and then claim to be in community with people who never consented to be in community with you, but your proximity to their identity again allowed you to profit. You know, I could also reference Joy, Dr. Joy James' shadow boxing, where she discusses how black feminism can be commodified, that there is not a universal, singular, monolithic like sort of frame of black feminism that we do have different shades and degrees of it where people will make the claim of being radical revolutionary, but they have been watered down for commercial use. And that we have people proudly claiming they are black feminists and taking sponsorships from like Shell Oil Company. We have people that are even weaponizing a black feminist identity as Patrice and her crew have done to say that no critique can actually stick, that we have no responsibility to publicly respond to anyone. <laughs> Girl, it's real rich in contradictions. They claimed to be about black radical liberation. But all I saw was the thinkers, the intellectuals, the leaders that were in this intimate community with Patrice disavow the outer networks that they had invited in, going on with their profitable endeavors while eschewing the same accountability within the framework of transformative justice that they themselves had published profitable works on. All this to say, that Patrice Cullors was, was in community with intellectuals who produce books, were on public speaking trails, who make substantial livings discussing reformative and transformative justice and the necessity of accountability. But when they had the opportunity to do the very work they profited from within their insular community as close friends within their insular community around Patrice Cullors as she faced very valid and serious critiques and accusations of harm, they had this opportunity to publicly display accountability in a, in a time where so many people conflate accountability with punishment. This would have been a great way to move the needle and to truly show people what we mean when we talk about accountability within the framework of accountability, that accountability is not punishment. Punishment is of the carceral state. It's because we live with all these prisons and police and uh, uh, you know surveillance of the state. That's not actual accountability. But instead, all they did was hide their hands. They went about quietly retweeting and reposting any support that leaned into simply dismissing the BLM accusations as racism. And that truly is such a significant loss. And I hope to never become that person that runs away from struggle in the same way that I have watched this elite group of black women thinkers move away from struggle when their friend Patrice Cullors was called out for her mismanagement. If you made it to the end, thank you for watching. I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love for you to comment, share the video. It just commenting and sharing helps so much. But again, I wanna give a big shout out and thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video and allowing this to happen. I hope you turned your ad blocker off because girl, that's how I pay my team. Between this sponsorship and you know, the ads, allowing some, a handful of ads to run. This is how we help to pay everyone for the labor that they contribute to getting videos like this off the ground. So thanks for watching. I'll see you on the other side. Deuces.